uh hello amazing people we are live now uh so happy to introduce you to this talk by building a talk called building hacker tooling by emil who is the co-founder of kaido we are so excited to hear the talk uh, before that let me just create a small alert so people can uh, see that this event is live Hello, hello. Hello, Emil. <laughs> I'm trying to keep. I'm gonna try to keep up with the chat. Uh, there if you guys are have questions. <laughs> there are already 79 people in this session. So That's excited! Good. People are so excited yeah. about you. So just uh, before we start, here are a little small announcements, people. So first of all, this is going to be an interactive session. So on your right side of the screen, you can see the chat option. You can drop your questions in the chat. And Emil has promised that he will be <laughs> mindful of the chats and he'll try to answer your questions. Uh, aside from that, all the uh, there are two parallel sessions going on. So if you miss this one or other sessions, you get lifelong access to all the recordings. So you can watch them later on as well. Uh, aside from that, the networking is going on all the time during our uh, fluid spaces and in our lounges. So you can check that out and feel free to join. Uh, also, please uh, note that you can add your profile pictures and your bio, detailed bio in your profile. I think that would be a really cool uh, way to present yourself, like who you are and what you do. And aside from that, our support launches available all through the event. So if you have any questions during the platform or any help, any way we can help you, feel free to go into the support lounge and ask your questions. All right. So I'll give the stage over to Emil now. Thank you for giving me your time. Uh, remember that at the bottom of your screen, there's an option called reactions. So whenever you like something that Emil is saying, feel free to throw us a lot of hearts. All right, Emil, the stage is now yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to my talk called Building Hacker Tooling, Insight into the First Year of Kaido. I'm really excited to present that, so let's get started. A bit about me first. I'm Emil, co-founder of Kaido. I uh, was previously a freelance developer and um, I've always had a passion for security. I've, I've always done a lot of CTF throughout my university years and I, I really like security in general. So I didn't make it a career, but now I think it's uh, my best spot where I can shine and build tools for hackers and uh, still be in the security world. So this talk is not super technical. I'm going to go over some technical stuff, but I just basically want to inspire you a bit to build stuff for yourself, for the community. And I really have a, a strong belief that the more tools we build, the more plugins we we build for tools, existing tools, the better our community is. And I'm not an expert on any of this, but I hope that my experience with Kaido over the last year can be of interest to, to some of you, and maybe spark uh, an interest to, to go build your own thing. So first, why build tooling? Um, we see a lot of stuff around that uh, people like to spend five hours writing code to automate a small task that takes five minutes. It's, it's a good quote, but you have to go a bit beyond that. Uh, one of the things that really shocked me a few years ago is when, show, when someone showed me a, a table similar to that, where you can see the duration of a task and the number of time uh, per day that you do this task, how much time over a working year, so around 260 days, it will basically take in your life. So even a mundane task that takes maybe 30 seconds that you do 10 times a day, it's still at the end almost 22 hours of your life that you spend doing this meaningless task. So there's always a way to automate more and more stuff. And I think it is something that is shocking at first. And then you can realize that it's important to automate even small little things that you do every day. So some of you might say, well, I don't know how to code. And that's totally OK. Uh, the best way to learn, in my experience, is by doing stuff. And the result that you come up with is not that important. The important part is the process that you go through and what you will learn through that process. And even if you start simple, it, it's totally OK too. Uh, you, you start with, I don't know, just a simple alias to go through your, your files. And then over time, you expand it. And then you build your old dot files. And then you start building more complex tools for, for, your, for your workflows. And 
you will have at some point a tool that saves you a lot of time. And that's the idea behind coding tools. And you have to remember that even the great people anywhere on this planet, they started by copying existing work. And there's no shame in going on GitHub, finding other people's work and just copying it for yourself. And then from there, expanding it to your own needs. And if you already know how to code, then coding tools allows you to elevate, uh, elevate your hacking skills. You'll become much more productive with the tools you already use because you can build plugins for them, you can build interaction, and you can craft novel attack types or just bring existing attacks into the tools you already use. And by building tools, you're going to get a deeper understanding of all the technical details behind your tools or behind your attacks. Anybody with time and a YouTube video can just launch Metasploit and attack a box, but not everybody can build a, an exploit or build a Metasploit itself. And we don't need to build Metasploit every day, but if you do the exercise at least once, you're going to get a lot of insight into how it works under the cover. And building tools is a great way to master a craft, and it doesn't apply only to computers, but to anything in my opinion. So how do we build tools? And that's just the blueprint that we used at Kado, um, just to, to give you an idea of how you can go through this process yourself. And the first step is really to get an idea. And in, in that camp, yeah, there are generally people fall uh, in two categories. They are either fall in the passive categories or they fall in the undecided categories. So either you have no idea or too many ideas. And neither ones are really good. But if we start with the passive one, you have to really force yourself to in, in a certain mood because ideas don't magically appear out of thin air. They foster with time and in the proper environment. And the best idea we came out uh, with are from talking with people in our community and then just trying it, trying it out. And you have to tell yourself that an idea is never perfect when it starts. And the idea will evolve, evolve over time, but if you never start, you're not gonna, never going to get there. And the other camp is really the undecided. And I fall in this category a lot. I like to toy around with many ideas, and I, I'm generally not decided on what I want to do. And that is something you have to, that requires discipline and planning for me, at least, because I have to remember that starting something is the easy part. And finishing it is the harder part because that's where it requires really a lot of uh, planning and establishing goals and steps to achieve them. And it's a good way to like revisit always your, your objective uh, regularly to see if they still make sense and adapt them if, if they don't. But in the end, the, the, the advice that I have is do one thing and do it well. Once you have an idea, you can go around and validate it. And it's a good and important step that is often overlooked. And it's really important to gain confidence in your idea. Uh, there's some approach that you can take to do that. We started by talking to people in the community, see how they felt about existing tools, what we could bring to, to the community. And then we went on social media and announced that Kaido uh, was a thing that we were working on. And even if it was very early in the development of Kaido, I think it's an important step that you can take, uh, especially for communities like hacking and smaller communities that are really active on Twitter. And if you get a positive response, then it's a, first a huge motivation boost for you. And it, it's going to just like validate that what you're working on is really important for other people. Um, now that we have an idea, we validate it. Now it's time to choose a tech stack. And users care about a lot of things. They care about performance. They care about features. They care about uh, usability of your tools. But one thing they universally don't care about is what language or framework you use. And that's something I always have to remember myself because that's something I do struggle with. And I'm often undecided about the tech stack I want to choose for a certain project. And we often hear, use the right tool for the right job. And it's a good advice, but it's not enough for me, at least. And uh, how I like to think about it is using constraint to help make me uh, make a, the, a choice that that is uh, um, that makes sense for me at the present. And 
some of the constraints I use is, do I want to learn something or do I want to use a language that I already know or a framework that I already know? What are my requirements for development speed versus the maintenance burden? The ease, ease of distribution, do I want a multi-platform uh, tool or do I just care about one platform? Do I care about efficiency at runtime or do, are, am I running on embedded devices? It's just some of the questions I ask myself. And I like to use a formal methods. Like I showed you the method I use on the right. I, I decided a couple of criteria, give them points. And then for each technologies, I give them a score and then I multiply that, sum that, and it gives me a score at the end that I can make uh, a choice that that is grounded in reality and then really objective but there's also other ways you can just do an informal pros and cons list and if you're okay with that it's also uh, good it, the important part is you gain confidence in your choices and then you stick with them over the lifetime of your project now that we have a tech stack it's time to write some code and what when you're building tools for hackers you're building for a certain community and you have to Think about that community first. One aspect of hacking is misusing technologies. It's core to the hacker ethos to tinker around, try to break stuff. And you do want to allow your user to break stuff all the time. So that means you're going to go behind, beyond the limits of your specification. If you just stick to your, the specification of HTTP or whatever protocol you're using, you're never going to get to the fun part where you have to deal with undefined and weird behaviors where the actual hacks are. And that means usually you have to build a lot of core things for your project, like an HTTP client. That's what we did for Kaido because we won't use our users to send garbage data to, to different servers to test how they react. So if we just stick to the, the base HTTP spec, we won't be able to do that. And what I like to do about that is I do a best effort uh, tool, basically best effort parser, best effort, whatever you want to say. Try to do as much as you can with the data that the user gives you, but don't try to get in the way of the user. And that's the, the core thing about it. And you also see that users will try to use your tool in, in unexpected ways. And it's awesome. I love it. But it's also scary. And it means that you need to adopt coding practices that focus on reliability over speed, in my opinion. And don't trust your user input becomes a whole nother set of... Uh, uh, requirements when you're dealing with hacker users. And it's not bad, it's just that you need to take it into account uh, when you're programming. Once you have a bit of code, you might want to start thinking about, do I write tests for my code? And I get it, most people don't like to write tests. I don't particularly either uh, enjoy doing that, but you have to view it as an investment for your tool. Uh, eventually, the, it will increase your confidence in shipping new features and it will allow for an easier refactoring without introducing regressions that will annoy, annoy your users. And the idea is that you will be also uh, allowed to allow you to accept more community contributions because you don't have to test every little thing every time someone wants to contribute to your tool. And this is especially important for open source communities. Our approach to it is we don't do a lot of testing before the initial code is stabilized. Uh, and we almost only do end-to-end -end testing because they have a longer lifetime and you can refactor the internals of your tool without any change to your, your test. And my rule of thumb personally is if I find a bug, I rate the test for it so I don't regress over time in, in our test coverage. Next up, let's talk a bit about user experience. It is really hard to design good human interfaces. Like if some of you have already did that at some point, you know that it's really hard. And my core principle is that I try to follow is the principle of least surprise. And it basically is like, if I have a link and I bring a link, my user expects that clicking on the link will bring him somewhere. It will not execute an action or do something. So the idea is just try not to surprise your user and make your user experience a priority in general. It, and it means a lot of different things, but it means onboarding processes. It means help menus and tooltips for complex features. It means autocomplete if you're building uh, CLI tools. And it, it also means example uh, for your libraries or your plugins. So it means a lot of things. But in the end, we all know that designing uh, user interfaces is hard. And if you cannot design a, a good interface, it's okay, but at least make it intuitive. 
because that's what the people will remember about your tool. And last topic I want to touch on in the writing code part is updates. For me, uh, people don't put a lot of effort into the update process and it's something that uh, is really important in my mind because users don't like to update. And why do they not like to update in general? Is because they've been uh, bitten before by developers that don't take the time to do a proper update mechanism. And for that, I have a couple of tips. So reduce the update frictions as much as possible. If you're building a library or plugins, use semantic versioning correctly so people know when they are breaking changes in, in your stuff. Use changelog a lot and make them verbose as much as possible so people also know what to expect. And if you can, offer a built-in update mechanism in your tool. You also have to reduce the risk of the dating for your user. And that is a trust that builds over time with you and your users. One thing that is critical is ensuring that all your user data is always preserved throughout the version. I've seen so many tools that lose user data beyond every time they update. So people just stop updating because it's not worth the effort and the risk. And if and for that, you need to write automatic migration steps so you can understand the old data formats and migrate them to the newer formats. That on the right, you see that's our migration for a SQL database. So it's really simple. Like if you've done development before, it's just you take execute the version one after the other, and then you get to the latest version where you can use the tool uh, with the old data. Once we have some code, now it's time to do everything else around coding. And I don't like to do anything else around coding. So my advice is try to automate as much as possible that is not coding so you can focus on your tool and you don't have to worry about anything else. And the other stuff that you have to worry about sometimes is the dependencies update, running the test, checking the code format, building, uh, publishing your, your, your libraries to package registries, building for each Mac OS, Windows, and Linux platforms, and building changelog. There is a lot of stuff that you can automate around your tool. I just wanted to give you an overview of what we do at Kaido. To All of those are different uh, GitHub actions that we run to automate as much as possible. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but if you guys have questions on it, I'm happy to come back and, and uh, answer them. Last topic I want to touch on is how do you build a community? Because once you have a tool, usually you want to share it with people, and that's a great thing. Uh, I have two advice on that. First, choose a place to gather your community. And it can be IRC if you're old school a bit, or it can be uh, for us, we decided Discord because that's where a lot of people in the Acker community are now on. And I think the lower the friction, the better for your community. But the problem with those instant messaging tools is they have poor discoverability of, of knowledge. So I highly recommend that you also choose a place for documentation and just another place that is indexed by search engine. And we use GitHub Actions a lot, uh, GitHub Issues, sorry, a lot, but you can also use GitHub Discussions, GitBook, read the docs, whatever you want, but do have another place where you can document stuff so people don't always ask the same questions in your uh, community. And when you're building a community, you will see that users are really demanding. Whatever it's open source, closed source, it doesn't matter, people, always demand new features. And it's easy to get overwhelmed. It's easy to get exhausted. Uh, we've seen it uh, times and times again. And our advice on that is uh, you can use upvotes to prioritize work, uh, but still sticking to your own objectives. So it will allow you to gamify a bit your the contributions to your projects. I al always like when people thank me in the con contributor change log when, or they can add me they can add a badge on Discord. It's always small things that make a difference for contributors, and it doesn't take you a lot of time. And you have to remember that uh, project maintainers, if you're a user of a certain uh, product, project maintainers love to have community contributions, even sometimes if they don't have the time to, to always respond very quickly. And my takeaway here is really take care of your mental health because that's the most important part and all of that. Otherwise, you cannot work and you cannot do anything. So in summary, building tools is a good exercise no matter your level. Uh, you should focus on one idea at a time and really do it well. Try to automate anything that is in not coding. 
choose a tech stack that fits your needs, build your tool for humans, invest in your test suite, and take care of yourself. Please do take care of yourself. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. I can take a bit of questions now, or I can go directly to to my uh, demonstration. It's for you. Uh, if you guys have questions already, I can answer them now. I'm just looking at the chat. Thank you for the amazing talk, uh, ML. We are getting some questions. We are getting some. Uh, cool. uh, we are getting a lot of requests from people for the demo. So I think cool. you should go ahead. Nice. People are saying the talk was amazing. We have like so many requests for demo. <laughs> That's we all have good. to go ahead with the demo. I'll go ahead with the demo then. Um, so you can start Kaido. It's a bit small probably, but you can start Kaido on any uh, VPS that you own, any, uh, yes, I can share the slide. Anywhere that you want to run Kaido, it's, it's running. Like you don't need to be on your desktop. If you want to be on your desktop, it's totally fine, but you don't need to be. Uh, we've seen a lot of people running Kaido in uh, their VPS in the cloud, so they don't need to have all their traffic on their local box. So when you open Kaido, you you see this page where you, you have all the projects that you have. I already created a small project, but it's really to create new projects. It's really easy to switch between projects. You just select it, just select it. You don't need to restart anything. It's all automatic. Um, so once you have selected the project, I'm going to pause our interception and then we're going to go to the forward page. So let's say I want to open uh, google.com. So oh, I forgot to forward it to my uh, demo. Okay, cool. So now we see the request that has come in. Uh, we cannot currently edit it, but it's on our roadmap, but you can forward or drop it. And you can send it to our replay. I'm going to send it to our replayer uh, for now. And I'm going to just forward it and see uh, what it does. Uh, I can already try to generate a bit more traffic if I can. Uh, let's see. OK, now I have a bit of traffic. So you can see all the requests, not just the latest one, but you can just decide which one you want. And it doesn't matter for us. You can always go in any order that you want, or you can resume it and then just uh, let them all pass. Um, we have uh, the intercept tool. So the intercept tool is really just the tool you expect where you're going to see all the requests that you have in your system that was intercepted by the, the proxy. And you can apply filter. So for now, I just applied a, a 200 filter so that I can remove it to see all the requests I add. Uh, and then I can sort them by different stuff. So I can sort them by destination as I, if I want. Uh, and I can then add, we have currently port method status code. We're working on more, more filter over time. So I can just say, oh, give me the 300. And I can also add scope. So the scope is, uh, right now I'm just scoping on, on google.com and I can create new scopes as I want. Uh, let's say I want, I don't know, I'm going to create another one uh, as Google and I can just say percentage, uh, dot google.com add it to my in scope and then save it, use it. And then I only have the request from google.com. If I want all the, all the requests, I can say, just give me percentage and then I can save it, use it. So I'll have all the requests that I have in a, in my uh, platform minus if I remove the scope. So, you know, now you're going to see like all the requests that I have in my system. So that's the idea behind the interceptions. We're adding more and more stuff as time goes on. Uh, and, and that's the goal of it. So the replay is where you're going to send your attacks and where you can modify the request. So that's the request I had uh, just um, in, in our, in our uh, forward tool just a while ago. And I can modify it as I want, just send it and see the response from um, from uh, Google in this case. Uh, we use uh, the VS Code editor under it. So uh, right now, you if you're familiar with it, you, you see it's uh, uh, very similar to the VS Code editor. And that allows us to do a, lot, a, a bunch of stuff. Right now, it's still pretty basic, but you can have at least a replace, a search and replace that is really performant and really good. Uh, and in the future, that will allow us to do a lot of good and uh, nice plugins in, in this view in particular. Um, that's the idea of it. Uh, let me see if I have uh, questions or I'm, I'm going to continue and then uh, we can uh, go down. So you, you can always like send your request. 
uh, you can edit the port. So let's say I want to simulate another an attack on another port. I just change it here. And then if the request is not going through, I can obviously cancel it. And then I can go back and forth with all my requests um, as you would expect for any tools. We do have plans to make this uh, interface a bit better on the top uh, so that you can uh, have folders and categories and tags as you go along. So you have a better categorized system. We also have the sitemap, or we call it the overview. So that's where you see all the, the, um, the websites that you visited and all the paths. We are currently rewriting it to make it um, a bit better and more uh, the, improve the user experience, but it still works. So you can see all the requests that I made to Twitter, and I can just open it and see the different paths uh, that I, I, um, I poke around. And if you want to see, like, we're expanding also, like, the request feed is similar to, to the intercept, but it also includes all the requests that you've made in other tools, so mainly the replay right now, but we're also working on an automate tool that will be released in about a month. Um, and so that will also be there in, in this request feed. It's just a log, and we're going to add the filters and scope also to this, this tool. Uh, we started working on a uh, conversion tool, so... That's similar to CyberChef if some of you are using it. We're going to open source it this part. Uh, hopefully within a couple of weeks, we'll see. And the idea is really that you can just add, I don't know, uh, different um, encoding and then you get a response and you can chain them as you like, uh, get a different response and it goes both ways. So uh, you, you can always like decode it, encode it, decode it. And we're going to, as time goes on, we're going to integrate that into the other tools so you can directly uh, use it uh, more efficiently or send data to it, retrieve data from it. And um, that's what we have right now. We've been working on it for a couple of months. And uh, our journey basically is we're going to be in private beta for a few months again, uh, two months. And then we're going to do a public beta for another four months. And then after that, it's going to be released. But uh, yeah, uh, do contact me if you, you want to try it out. And uh, otherwise, in a couple of months, you will, uh, a month and a half, I would say, you will be able to use it uh, publicly. So that's it for me. So if you have questions, I can show you other stuff. I can uh, answer any questions that you have. So let's see. I have a question for you, uh, Emil. I'm going to show it on stage uh, so that other people can see it as well. So, uh, hi, Emil. I have signed up for a better version of Kaido.io before a couple of months. May I know when your team will process accept the beta requests? Yeah, so we're going like through uh, basically the oldest uh, beta request, and we have uh, around 2,000 people. So we're going truly, slowly to, to through that list. Uh, we do... If you're really excited about it, just you can always ping me. You can make a small <laughs> change in the list, but uh, otherwise, yeah, it's we're it's unfortunate. It's we really want to accept everyone, but we also don't want to get overwhelmed. Uh, we're really public. Uh, we're really trying to build it in the public, so we have the GitHub issues people can vote on, and uh, we just try to get our community uh, slowly started. So uh, yeah, it's it's a tough questions, but I'm I'm trying to balance the. <laughs> The people wanting to try the tool and just our, our capacity to just manage everything um, and where the tool is at right now. The 2,000 requests are amazing. I hope you're proud of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> another question. Well, another question is, first question is, how does it feel to take Burp Suit head on? Uh, it is hard, I would say. Like, But we, we don't have, like, for, for me, I see the, the landscape as, like, the more competition, the better. We're trying to bring something new uh, in the market. And I think we're, we're going to see other tools app, uh, appear as time goes on. And for, for me, sure. it's not, it, there's space for everybody, I think. And then we do, obviously, I have a bias. I, I'm super excited about my tool, but uh, I do think it's a hard like challenge. It. And then we're going it slowly. We're just like learning from the community, stuff we do well, stuff we don't. And we just improve that way. And we really listen. My my edge uh, and my my conviction is we can do anything with time and by listening to the community what the community wants and that's my vision of it. Um. So amazing. 
uh, how does it feel to build in public the pressure of failing in public? It, it is hard. It is hard. <laughs> uh, but it, it is a challenge that I'm willing to accept. And I think it has a lot of benefits. Uh, I mean, so far, a lot of people like to use our tool and we know that we have bugs. We know that we don't have all the features and it's okay. People are, are good with it because they know that we're really working hard on that and and we're really passionate and we really want to build the best thing for you guys. And, and uh, we started like, and my point was when my uh, Corbenic, my, my co-founder started using it for his own bug bounty. That's why I said like, okay, now we're at a point where like it, it is good and, and we, we can work on it, but like we, at least we have a base where, where uh, it's usable. And, and, and I like that. So, and we're just expanding from there. Amazing. Uh, so before we go ahead, I would like to make a small announcement to the people who are watching here. Uh, on the top right of your screen, you will see a bell icon, which is for alerts. So keep checking your alerts from time to time. Whenever something cool is going on, we are going to send you a notification. So make sure you don't miss out on these alerts. Also, if you're enjoying these sessions, if you're enjoying Emil's presentation, don't forget to take some screenshots and tag us on Twitter. Tag Emil, tag Kaido, tag InfoSec write-ups, and show us some love in the reaction sections as well. Yeah, yeah. I have a few other questions. Do I have still time? Or, uh, yes, we do good? have. You do have time. Cool. So uh, we were asking, uh, someone was asking, if you're running the tool for five, four or five hours, it's running in Chrome. How much resources will it use? So that's a really good question. Uh, we're really mindful about our resource usage. Uh, the, on the back end side, it's really not that much. Like it's gonna stay like at, uh, at around 200 megabytes of RAM. Uh, it's always gonna stay like that. We use a lot of, of SQL. So every all the data is on your disk. So obviously the faster the disk you have, the better. And um, on, the, on the front end, we try to load as, as little as possible from our back end. So when you do navigate between, uh, when you scroll, we, we unload data and we load data. So it does mean that you're going to have more network traffic, but it does also mean that you have a lot less uh, RAM usage in your browser. So we do try to make, we're really, really conscious about that because that's one of our big reasons for starting Kato is we wanted something that takes less RAM and that is resource efficient. So that's something, if, we're not perfect, but we really have that uh, first thing on our mind. I hope it does answer your question. So, sir, I have uh, the second question. Much interest in building tools. No idea methodology how to build it. How do I develop that knowledge? I often brush up my basics, but I can figure out how to build proper tools based on my ideas. So, like I said, the most important thing is start small and then expand over time. So, you, you just... Pick a language, pick, pick a, if you know a language, that's the best thing. Uh, if not, just like, I don't know, pick Python, pick a simple language that is still powerful and then build something very simple. And over time, you're going to pick up structure and then you're going to hit the limit of your current structure. You're going to refactor it. And then at some point, you're going to get better. It's a, it's not a process that it comes overnight. And before I, I could build a good project, it took me many years and I think it's a normal process of learning. So um, so also if it crashes, request response data will be stored. Yeah, so basically, yeah, yeah, it can crash. It doesn't matter. Everything is stored on disk uh, in a SQL database. Eventually we'll want to expose it to the plugins. We have a whole a lot of ideas around plugins that we want to implement. Um, that is a hard problem, so we're not tackling it right now, but it's coming in uh, probably this summer, the plugins. Uh, and yeah, but you for sure the data is, is totally safe. Uh, no worries there. Uh, you will always keep your data. What we've seen is a lot of people, since it's so easy to create and change between projects, uh, people tend to use a lot more of the projects that we were expecting. Uh, so lots of projects and lots of ideas around how we can share eventually the projects in teams, if you have a larger team, how uh, we can improve the workflow for sharing stuff between the teammates. Amazing. Um, we have another question. This is from yep. the chat section. Uh, cool. How? What is your long-term vision enterprise? Yeah, uh, that is a good question. Uh, right now, we, 
we focused a lot on uh, bug bounty hunters and pen testers and small companies of pen tests. That's our current focus uh, because it's just easier for people to try the tools and it uh, and just like try it at home, try it for CTF, and then try it for their own. Uh, people do use it for for commercial use already, so that's I'm always happy to hear that. Uh, and I think eventually we're gonna move toward a bit the enterprise, but I'm. Honestly, we decided to go in a bootstrap way because we don't have strings. So we can do whatever we want. We don't need to, we don't have uh, quotas or like growth rate that we need to respect. And that is very important for me that we always listen to the community and always go back to where we came from. And we want to offer products for the enterprise, obviously, uh, collaboration features, um, access control. We add a lot of. Uh, um, talks with people from uh, different companies where they say, oh, I want to hire this bug bounty firm, but I I don't want them to be in my network or I just want to provide them an interface. So for us, it's really, we think we have something really special because we can run Kaido on any cheap VPS box. And if you want to just set it up for a company or anything, and just, we are going to work on access control a bit later on this year. And once we do that, you'll be able to assign people uh, and we're going to create a, a concept of Kaido accounts where you can share in Kaido teams. So that's uh, that's our longer term vision. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so uh, this is more of a request instead of a question. I recently, uh, I think, yeah, we, we do uh, answer that. Uh, yeah, so it's hard. I'm, I'm trying to get everybody in, but... Uh, Slowly and surely, uh, you can ping me on, you can ping us on Twitter. We try to, uh, but also at the same time, we don't want to be overwhelmed there, so I don't push it too much. Um, thank you for your patience. That's all I can say. Um, okay. Uh, well, this will be free or paid. Uh, this one, uh, it will be paid for starting because we're a bootstrap company. That's the disadvantage when you don't have fundings, you do may need to make a living. Um, but we do plan to have a free tier at some point once we are a bit more uh, advanced. Um, and But it is, it is important for us to be uh, accessible to everybody. And that's something I don't know, I don't have a good answer yet, but uh, we wanna make sure that it is accessible for everybody. So I don't know, we'll see how, how the form takes, but for me, it's really important uh, that it, the monetary cost does, doesn't become a barrier, but at least we can make a living and you can make a living. And that's how we win, I think. Uh, what do you think? A big issue with Burp is uh, resource hungry. So yes, I think I just, I, I did uh, answer that question already. Uh, we do are man mindful of that. So that's every everything from the back end to the front end, we do take a lot of uh, responsibility on our how we use resources and that's why we decided rust in part in the back end and why uh we well the front end you can do as much as you can like it's still a javascript engine but we do try to optimize it as much as possible um would it be possible to modify responses i don't really know the what you want to do with that but i'm open to chat if you want to Ping me on Twitter. I would be interested to know uh, what's your use case there uh, to modify responses. Ah, uh, you mean probably in transit? Yes. If, if it is in transit, yes, it will be possible. Yeah. What about macros? Yes, that's something super nice that we want to work on. Um, I have lots of ideas about that. Uh, I want to be able to like just put tags in your request where you can just infer stuff with scripts and stuff like that. I have a lot of ideas there. Uh, it's just that it takes time. So <laughs> like I said, we're doing it slowly. We're just expanding it, making sure that everything is stable. We don't regress over time. It does take a lot of energy just to stay at that. So uh, slowly but surely. Uh, I have a few minutes. Uh, what other thing we found in Kaido, which is not present? Uh, vulnerability scanner uh, is not present yet uh, because that's not something we uh, focus on a lot of the bug bounty is really manual work uh, we want to have a vulnerability scanner at some point it's just not been a priority and it's not a priority for the next few months i would say even end of year so. 
Uh, I think I've uh, answered all the questions. Uh... Yeah, all of them have been answered. So you know, okay. you can take up a, uh, you can take up a boot maybe. Uh, yep. Table in the uh, lounge for a few minutes. Yep. So everyone who's attending this session, ML will be available for the next say 15 minutes, 20 minutes in our lounge. So when you go to the lounge, you will see three tables. So ML will be there on the first table. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much everyone for listening and I'll see you on the table uh, just momentarily. Right. Uh, thank you so much people for attending this session. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I loved it. So please feel free to share on Twitter about how much you like it. We'll be really, really grateful about any kind of love and support you can show us. This is the first time we're doing something of this scale. And we are so happy and so humbled to see so many people so excited about this. Uh, also, Emil, thank you so much for taking time out to be a speaker uh, and for showing trust in us. Because Enforcer Red Ops is organizing a conference for the first time. So yep. it is really our honor and our pleasure to have you. And, your and it's our first conference as a, as a company also. So uh, <laughs> really excited uh, to be part of that. It's really amazing. We are so, so happy to have you as a part of our first ever conference. Uh, so yes, that's it for this session. Uh, people, I'm just reminding you again, uh, the next talk is going to happen in 20 minutes. We have two parallel sessions. You can check out our schedule and whichever talk relates to you more. Uh, feel free to attend them. So there are 20 minutes left. So feel free to check out our networking rooms and also uh, go and ask questions to ML in the lounge. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.